very brief on our presentation to maximize time for questions afterwards. So for the past 30 years, China has been developing its information capabilities based on some of their observations that they identified during the Gulf War and have expressed um, the desire to become a regional hegemon. In 2018, Brand conducted a study that identified China's approach to information um, using systems confrontation as well as systems destruction. The goal of system destruction for the PLA is to interfere with their enemy's system of systems, right? They viewed warfare as a conflict between operational systems, that being cognitive, that being operational, as well as um, technical, their, their network. My study explored how China uses information to reunify with Taiwan. Um, to do that, I assessed what strategic conditions uh, were established in the Taiwan Strait for Taiwan to initiate an information conflict with Taiwan. I also looked at how China uses information in relation to Taiwan specifically, which uh, during the study I identified that it is not the same as the international community. So uh, the two strategic conditions that I identified as being the reason that China will use information as its main effort in reunifying with Taiwan is one, the strength of the Taiwanese government. Uh, the second being the likelihood of the U.S. to intervene if the, uh, excuse me, if China was to uh, invade Taiwan. I assessed that a weak and fragmented Taiwanese government paired with a low likelihood of U.S. intervention uh, would increase the probability that China would use information as its main effort and uh, mechanism towards reunification. So what would that approach look like? First, uh, the Communist Party of China establishes the, the narrative, the one China principle, right? This is how they shape the information dimension in relation to Taiwan and China. They want the entire world to see that there is no delineation between the, the two uh, nations. Um, in addition to that, it uses mass media, propaganda, economic coercion, political influence uh, to lead the Taiwanese people to also believe in that one China principle. Um, my study assessed that China did not reach information advantage in that regard because the Taiwanese people are continuing to move away from the one China principle and Taiwanese independence is actually uh, the majority, uh, it is the narrative of the Taiwanese people. In fact, the Democratic People's Party in Taiwan is actually the majority. They're the ruling party currently and they are specifically for Taiwanese independence. Um, in addition to that, um, I conducted a multiple case study looking at the 1955 and the 1996 Taiwan Strait crisis. During those crises, China used the methods that I mentioned before, propaganda, uh, political coercion, economic coercion, and it did not lead to their desired effects, right? They wanted to have that one China principle narrative in Taiwan promulgated by Taiwanese people. That did not happen. In fact, the opposite happened. You had pro-Taiwanese independent uh, politicians being elected, as well as the uh, economic development within Taiwan and cross-strait trade increasing, not necessarily uh, leading to a pro-China uh, narrative being in, in Taiwan. With that said, China was not adverse to failure in the information dimension. They were okay with those failures. However, they continued to develop their ability to push that narrative, continue to develop economically between China, as well as limiting how much trade they were uh, bringing in, how many uh, imports that they were receiving from China while increasing the exports to Taiwan, right? Um, with that said, the likelihood of a uh, Chinese information um, operation in Taiwan is going to continue to increase because they have uh, no reason to invade Taiwan because 
the Taiwan Relations Act, right? The United States will not uh, interfere with them as long as they are not invading with a military force, right? So they're able to use that information dimension to continue to pursue their uh, reunification in state. But with that said, technology has improved and their ability to uh, limit the Taiwanese independence in the international stage uh, has continued to develop. And the way that uh, China addresses that is through information control. And I will be followed by Kendall Garmer to explain a little bit how the United States can exploit vulnerabilities in that strategy. Kendall. Good morning. Um, so the genesis for my thesis uh, really stems from an experience I had about 11 years ago. I was sitting in a hotel in Shanghai, China, and I was watching BBC World, and the TV went black. And I sat there and I thought to myself, there has to be something that we can do for, to, integrate, to exploit this mentality. The mentality was, I don't know what the news story was going to be. I have no idea, but my TV went black and now I will never know. And that was a very uncertain feeling for me, especially coming from America where that is not our norm, <laughs> as I will say. So fast forward, here we are looking at how China uses information control. And one of their methods very clearly is just to prevent the information from entering by all means necessary. Uh, and so in order to understand how they control the information, I looked at three different events. The first was the Tiananmen Square incident of 1989, recognizing that this has been a long-standing um, black mark on their history that they have very actively tried to erase. The second is the Hong Kong protests of 2019, this was something that the Chinese were able to prevent from their domestic population from knowing about for a long time. However, eventually they just did need to counter using information control mechanisms because you can't keep information from people forever. And then third was the COVID-19 response of 2020, recognizing that this is very drastically changing actively as we speak. In fact, the New York Times ran an article about it just last week talking about some of the changes to information control. So if that's something that interests you, we can talk about that during the question and answer, but it was not involved in my thesis. So I looked at these responses and tried to identify vulnerabilities that we could take advantage of in the, in the information dimension. And there were four uh, vulnerabilities that I was able to identify. The first is that the Chinese government is likely to over-censor. An example of this is leading up to the anniversary of Tiananmen Square, they will start to censor the word tomorrow. So you're sending a tweet about tomorrow. I have a birthday party tomorrow. Whatever information you're trying to get out there, and it won't send. So then you're like, why can't I send this tweet? Or, well, they won't use, they'll use Weibo. But um, to use our terminology, you know, to tweet something. Why can't I get this information out? What is going on tomorrow? And so that sparks a concern. So that's a vulnerability. When you over-censor something, you actually increase the awareness of the event. The second is that the Chinese populace is very comfortable with identifying and creating alternative language and nickname development. So this means things like another way to refer to an individual. Um, they know that the information is controlled, so it's part of their nat natural instinct to say, how could I say this? I'm going to find a way to say what I want to say. Uh, so they're creative and innovative, and they're going to get the information out there. So we need to, well, I'll get to my results in a second. Uh, so the third thing is the information gap confusion. This was very clearly seen during the protests in Hong Kong, where you saw the stock market rise significantly after an announcement about withdrawing the bill that initiated those protests to begin with. And so people on mainland China were like, what's going on with the stock market? Because the they couldn't restrain all the information. They were resisting the news stories, they weren't allowing all these things to happen, but they saw the stock market prices. And so there's a gap in the information space because reality continues to move forward even if you control the information. It just might be my other means, perhaps e economic or other opportunities. And then the th fourth is that there's a motivation to circumvent the censorship. 
This was very clearly identified during the COVID-19 2020. As things continued to get censored, the Chinese people were downloading VPNs at a crazy rate. We actually saw this in Russia as well, so recognizing that it perhaps is cross-cultural and not unique to China, though for this thesis I focused on China. When you know your government censors information and you recognize that there is something going on for a very limited window, there is a curiosity that will drive you to say, what is really going on? You might not do anything with that information, but someone who might normally never try to circumvent the government systems will be like, let me find out why I'm not allowed to travel to Wuhan, why I can't bring my grandpa back home. Let me look up this information because I want to know, I need to know it's affecting me on a personal level. So with those four vulnerabilities identified, um, I created, I um, came up with three strategic approaches that we can use to exploit those vulnerabilities. So the first which is a passive indirect approach strategy, which is just looking at the creation and transparency. So because we have that limited window where the population is going to try to circumvent, we need to make sure the information is out there and available for them to find. Because they did all this work to circumvent the system and then there's no narrative. We haven't put out the narrative that we need them to identify. So that's first and foremost, recognizing that it's in the proper language, recognizing that it's consistent with our goals as an organization, and so creation and transparency. The second is the exposure and in initiating turbulence uh, and distraction within the system. This is as we move closer to the, um, away from along the conflict continuum, so closer to conflict, where we have exact event that we're trying to counter. And we actually saw this, ironically enough, with Ukraine. This is the exposure, this is the pre-bunking, this is changing something in their um, understanding of the information dimension to throw them off their game, if you will. It takes a lot of effort to control information. Some of the um, some of the memos that were going across the Chinese government when they were trying to counter COVID-19 were desperate. They were absolutely desperate to try to get a hold of the narrative. And it was scary, the amount of hundreds of thousands of people working solely on controlling the information and controlling that narrative. So it takes a lot of effort. And if we can counter that by throwing something else into, into the information dimension, it will only continue to increase and distract that effort. And the third uh, would be as we've reached the, the level of armed conflict, and that would of course be penetration and direct disruption. So recognizing that the Chinese have a firewall perhaps, or they have technical capabilities and actually countering that with technical skills uh, that we have, allowing VPNs to be available where perhaps they've previously been blocked. And I'm, you know, in this space, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the technical things, but I like to believe that we as the United States have the capability to, to input those, even though sometimes they might be recognized as the escalation. So with that, um, I will turn it over to any questions that you have for either Darrell, he'll come on up with me, um, as far as China and uh, their use of information advantage. So China seems good at setting the narrative. China seems good at changing a historical narrative. How have they reacted? Because I'm confident we have, I just don't have the evidence to show. How have they reacted when we have tried to change a narrative? I mean, maybe COVID-19 is a great example with Wuhan. How have they reacted? How has that changed their, their practice? Uh, how quickly do they react? I mean, how effective is that? So um, the greatest example is like what's happening right now in Shanghai, in China with the COVID-19. So. Um, there has been a lot of information. They've seen a kind of an uprising almost on the internet. So what they've done is they started to publish IP addresses very prominently on all their social media platforms. So if you post something, it'll say, this is a US IP address. And then all the trolls will come out and be like, you're anti-China, you're not a real Chinese person. Like, I can't believe you're saying this and just start to attack almost to the point where, you know, these could even be Chinese nationals living in the United States. It also could be someone using a VPN. There are a lot of reasons why you could have a US IP address. And so these people then have to defend themselves. There was a um, recent report of a gentleman who is Chinese, he's in Japan, and he's there, and he started posting things. He's been using Weibo for 10 years. He's never had, you know, he's a Chinese gentleman, very um, patriotic. and. 
people were like, why are you in Japan and why are you using Weibo? And it got to the point where he had to shut down his account and he tried to write, he wrote an essay about it. He's like, I'm in Japan for these like medical reasons. I'll be back in China. I'll die a Chinese man. I'm a Chinese man. And he ended up just shutting down his account because these IP addresses are being, so that's like kind of the newest step to control this information is like if we can't prevent the information from coming in, um, then what we'll look at is how to make you disbelieve to getting to Danny's point a little bit, you know, the information that you see, give you a reason to distrust these people that are countering the Chinese narrative, because ultimately that's what it's all about. It's having a, I think one of the terms that they recently used is a unified narrative on the internet. So making sure and losing some of that anonymity that we're used to seeing in the United States. Can I piggyback on that just a little bit? So in my study, I use the Taiwanese three eyes model. That's how China, uses information in Taiwan. And to describe what um, Kendall was discussing just now, that would be what they call a connected level information manipulation, right? Connected level means that the Chinese, the PRC, CCP established that narrative that uh, Kendall was referring to, and then they use low level individuals that are not directly connected with the government to push that narrative or to counter the narrative that is penetrating the Chinese community or, in my case, Taiwan. But that, that, that is the way that they're doing it now. And that study actually came out in December 2021. Just a quick point of clarification on that. When you say push down lower levels, is that then coordinated from it's a not, government approach? Okay, so they're just relying on nationalism to Correct. kind of carry the wave? They do have coordinated information campaigns, but at a connected level or a low level operation. Not uh, in the way that you guys were just discussing. Yeah. Sir. Hey, this question is for Major Young uh, <clears throat> regarding, uh, regarding China's messaging on uh, Taiwan. Uh, does the global community's use of strategic ambiguity and the, uh, the One China pr principle uh, enable or defang uh, China's IA ops? in terms of Taiwan? Great question. I was hoping someone spoke to strategic ambiguity. I think that it defangs it, honestly. Um, I would say, given, I'm gonna just go ahead and bring up the president's comments um, recently about um, responding to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Um, some say that that is not strategic ambiguity. I would argue against that, that it is, right? Because our policy, the Taiwan Relations Act, still supports you know, uh, the relationship that we have with Taiwan, right? It still supports, says, it, it supports what the president said. It says that if there's not peaceful reunification, that we would get involved. Um, I think that uh, as long as we have strategic ambiguity, there won't really be a case for an invasion. However, I don't think that we have an unlimited amount of time, right? because China is still developing the capabilities to ignore a U.S. intervention, right? If they have the de defensive capabilities to protect themselves and to conduct a limited scale invasion of Taiwan and reunify without like completely destroying the island and its economy, I think that they would attempt to do that. But I say strategic ambiguity gives us time and it gives us the ability to maneuver within that information space. I think we have time for one more question. That's that's their equivalent of Twitter, Twitter, but there are a few other social media accounts in China that are pretty robust. So essentially, just by um, um, by what I guess they call social media work. Yeah. So I think that where the Chinese government going, and this is just, you know, Kendall's opinion, this is, you know, in studying this. And so I should also say I wrote a previous thesis on China's use of emotional intelligence um, 
to move forward in their national objectives, so utilizing that as well, um, a little bit from what I learned there. I would say that they're trying to force a national narrative that is self-regulating. So they want to rely on, ult their ultimate goal would be not to have to censor anything because we censor ourselves. Because I know that if I put something on the internet, my next door neighbor will tell on me or my family will lose face. Um, you know, we see the, them using uh, billboards to put up faces of jaywalkers, right? So the shame aspect of it. So I think the ultimate goal is to alleviate some of the need for censorship because we have such a self-regulating society and the desire to stay away from chaos is so important to the culture. Um, however, that is a lofty goal um, because humans are humans, um, regardless of what culture you grew up in. And so some of the mechanisms in addition to like single word is they do start to um, kind of just remove accounts, you know? So we start to see um, you just get blocked. One day you might have the capability to get on Weibo, the next day you might not have the capability to get on. Um, and then there's also the aspect of um, tying your social media account back to your social credit scores, um, which brings a whole nother aspect of self-regulation. Um, so I think those, those are kind of where I see them going. As far as what the US can do to kind of counter and how army generals, I think that we need to be sure that we have a unified strategy and information dimension, which sounds kind of funny because I'm talking about the Chinese unified narrative. Um, but the only way to effectively counter this is to recognize the space you're in, and it has to be for very specific events. So if we are countering a specific incident, and I'll use the 2019 protests in Hong Kong, right? Um, say we were, the US Army was involved in, um, in those, I think they need to recognize, like we they support this narrative, this narrative is important to us. Uh, one of the things that happened in mainland China was they censored the song um, from Les Miserables, people, uh, the people will stand up. It's a, you know, very revolutionary song. And that actually got censored and removed from all Chinese music because they didn't want people to be inspired by that. And so what is in the U.S.'s interest is making sure that we include music into it, looking at across the whole dimension that we don't just censor words. We censor music, we censor what can be bought, we censor, um, and so exploiting kind of that information gap, like your favorite song can no longer be heard, like those sorts of things. So just looking across the information dimension at more than just, just social media, and Danny will be quick to tell anyone that social media only reaches a certain percentage of the population, and so how are we reaching beyond those initial steps, even though that's easy to um, use as a measure of performance measure of effectiveness. Can I piggyback on you real quick? Please. I, I also think that we have to look at the international community, like the NDS and Indo Paycom strategy all talks about how partnerships and alliances are important. It's even more important in the information space and in the information dimension because it is shaped differently depending on which country you're looking at, right? <laughs> For instance, China using uh, Weibo and we using us using Twitter, right? You will not be able to assess how the information dimension is shaped in China by uh, looking at Twitter or injecting information into Twitter. We're gonna have to use our partnerships and alliances to help shape the international information dimension and uh, you know, develop a, a way to really look at that space and affect it, right? And China's certainly doing that. I'll leave this as a final, right. but you made me think of, uh, in Malaysia, uh, that China was able to get one of their um, newspapers completely censored and removed from circulation based on their economic power uh, in the region. And so recognizing that they have control in the information space uh, in a democracy is pretty significant. Yeah. I want to give you one closing one. So, <laughs> hey, just so, uh, and, 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 and as you're kind of looking up at Danny, I, I kind of kept thinking about, is there anything that, that we should be learning, and this is to all three of you, in terms of the examples that we're seeing in China and the systems that are being applied there, to then looking at the public affairs arena and in this other space. You know, I'm, and I joke around a lot about it because of the ham-fistedness of it, but there's a, a real significant tie or a thread between uh, TTP, excuse me, case studies that derail you had had 
And obviously, Kendall, from your analysis, kind of tying that right back into then the other side of it, which is really ourselves internally. You know, as you were speaking, I kept thinking about counter messaging. Correct. And I didn't get a chance to ask that question, but the counter message that the Chinese will give to us is they point to civil rights, mm -hmm. uh, point to our actions not being on certain, uh, you know, not being a part of certain treaties. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I'm just kind of interested in just kind of your three take in terms of like what should we from a U.S. side be taking uh, and then probably looking at in terms of the future. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start with it. Well, first of all, I think that Kendall's line uh, during her, her speech there where it takes a lot of effort to control information um, becomes very key. And so when we look at the counter messaging, I think that is a strategic advantage that we have is we, uh, we support that information going out and, and other people having the ability to impact information. There's obviously risks with that too, but those risks support our democratic values and ideals. I think when it comes to like how we should look at this counter messaging, and this is something that, I mean, I've said numerous times, it goes back to the audience and the environment. And, and having individuals that, that understand the audience, the environment they're operating in, and how information works. Um, I think that information is a weapon, as was stated, but it's a weapon that is so malleable and can be used so effectively in different ways the, that the, the training on how to use it and when to use it, um, depending on the audience and the environment, is really important. I think, and also recognizing that everything is a signal Right, so um, it's not just about the message that the P, um, public affairs officer puts out, it's also about the message that your soldier puts out. And we've learned this lesson time and time again um, over the past 20 years. Um, but I think we have to recognize that it happens outside of armed conflict as well. It happens, um, you know, every day we're in competition and, um, you know, we're becoming much more vocal about that we're in competition every day. And so recognizing that building that trust and continuing that narrative is, um, is a requirement to be in that environment. Anything to add? I tried to think about this long and hard, sir. Um, I agree with both Danny and Kendall. I think that we probably need to look more so at what our themes and messages are and what they're going to be moving forward. I don't think that we've identified a, a unified message to counter China's one principle, uh, Ch one China principle narrative. I don't think that we have that yet. Um, I do think that um, some of the things that Danny mentioned about, you know, democracy and being able to, you know, challenge uh, the information that's been put out into the information dimension is good, but it also helps shape our approach. Like we don't realize that, you know, the average American is helping or hurting our information operation in relation to China. Like the every single tweet, every single, you know, communication that's sent out into the space is is impacting uh, our interaction with China. Right. And I think that one, if we identify what that, that message or that theme is going to be that's going to counter the Chinese narrative, that you know, we figure out a great way to uh, inform the American public of what that is and how they can help that narrative, but also you know, enforce it from a military standpoint, like what exactly we're doing when it comes to maneuver exercises in the Indo-Pacific all of those things are, are tying into that information dimension. And I think that if we identify that one, um, maybe it's many, but that message or that theme that we want to get behind to counter it and we feel like it's effective or assess that it's effective, that you know, we could put our efforts <laughs> behind that. Well, thank you very much for your time. And um, we'll go on lunch and the next briefing will be at 1230. Thank you.